Tonight, a collision course on board the SeaWorld helicopter with impact imminent. A passenger's frantic warning to the pilot. A Parkley property raided, counter-terror police arrested Islamic State bride, saved from Syria by our government. Teens charged, accused of terrifying carjackings across Sydney's west. Premiers join forces calling for a Medicare makeover to increase the number of bulk billing doctors. We're live to the Vatican as tens of thousands of people prepare to farewell Pope Benedict. Plus, Steve Smith and Usman Khawaja create history as Australia dominates the SCG test. This is Nine News with Amelia Adams. Good evening. Tonight, we can show you the terrifying moment of impact as seen by those on board one of the helicopters involved in the SeaWorld tragedy. Moments into the video, a chilling realisation from a passenger in the back as the second helicopter comes into view. And a warning, some viewers may find images in this story distressing. The moment of impact caught on camera. Even more terrifying, they saw it coming. As the pilot approaches SeaWorld, you can see the second helicopter taking off. A male passenger in the back seat spots it and points. He reaches forward frantically trying to warn the pilot, but it's too late. All he can do is brace. The impact smashing the windscreen, ripping open the front of the helicopter, the pilot somehow managing to land safely. The collision sending the other helicopter to the ground, killing four people on board, three others remain in hospital. Four days after the tragedy, the four shaken New Zealand tourists who escaped with their lives still processing what happened. A day they'll never forget. A fun five-minute joyride on vacation to Australia turned into a nightmare. The Steenbergs and the Swartz releasing a statement today expressing their gratitude to all who helped them, thanking their pilot Michael James, their hero, for bringing their chopper down safely. While they are grateful and blessed to have been spared, they say they are very sad for the people who lost loved ones and the little ones and mum fighting for their lives in hospital. Our hearts are heavy for them. Today, united by grief, the family of Ron and Diane Hughes, their children and grandchildren gathered at the memorial, reading tributes left for the UK couple. SeaWorld helicopter director John Orr Campbells released his first statement over the incident, offering condolences and support to the families and passengers. The director also revealed Ash Jenkinson, who was killed on Monday, was a first-class pilot with more than 6,000 flying hours to his name. He received his commercial licence 15 years ago, an instructor for the past 12. To lose a man and a pilot of Ash's calibre is shocking in every sense of the word. I, along with all the staff at SeaWorld Helicopters, are gutted to the core, he said, leaving the aviation community and the nation still in shock over how two simple joy flights turned deadly within seconds. This video to be examined thoroughly by air crash investigators. At least one aviation lawyer believes flight procedures and protocols at the operation could come into question. Why were the two aircraft in that same position? Why did their, the company procedures allow that to occur? He says the investigation could eventually pave the way for legal action by victims and their families. Queensland law is uh, very robust in that regard. Ten-year-old Nicholas Tadros from Sydney remains on life support tonight, but in some positive news, nine-year-old Leon De Silva has showed signs of recovery today. No longer critical, he's in a stable condition. Josh Bavis, Nine News. Islamic State bride Mariam Rad has been arrested in the state's central west as counter-terror police raided a Park Lee property in western Sydney. Rad was repatriated late last year. She's accused of willingly travelling to Syria, where police say she knew her husband was involved with ISIS. Australian Federal Police pouring over this Parkley property, home to Islamic State bride Mariam Debussy and her family, and where her sister-in-law Mariam Rad returned to when the two women were rescued from Syria by the Australian government last October. Rad married the math teacher turned Islamic State recruiter Mohammed Zahab, who reportedly convinced dozens of his relatives to join him in Syria, where Australian security officials considered him one of the most senior members of the terrorist group. 
group. Rad has been arrested today in the central west town of Young, where she has been living, charged with previously entering and remaining in parts of Syria that were under the control of the Islamic State terrorist organisation. It will be alleged that she willingly travelled to Syria in early 2014 to join her husband and that she was aware of his role with Islamic State. Her husband was killed in an airstrike in 2018. Rad lived in a refugee camp in Syria's northeast before she was repatriated by the Albanese government government last year, along with 14 other women and their children. These people were let back into the country, we were told that it was safe, and now we find out that there are concerns by the police and the charges are being pressed. Concerns that were flagged by three Western Sydney mayors at the time. The Home Affairs Minister sat down with them in an attempt to ease them. In the background, counter-terror police launched a covert investigation into Rad while she was on Syrian soil. New evidence now allowing them to charge her, putting her before a magistrate tomorrow. She could face up to 10 years in prison. The government should have done a lot more to make sure that they done their preliminary homework prior to bringing them back and of course it does erode trust in the Australian community. Sophie Upcroft, Nine News. A teenager accused of holding a father at gunpoint and stealing his car in Bosley Park is tonight behind bars. The alleged carjacker has been charged along with a 17 year old but police believe there are others involved. A young removal is stopped mid-shift and cuffed. Fidel Shimon arrested at South Windsor, accused of terrorising two people in separate armed carjackings in Sydney's West last month. Today, lads, we're on the, news. the acts uh, by these males are considered extremely dangerous and reckless and involves acts of violence. At the intersection of Prairie Vale and Cowpasture Road, police say the 18-year-old and his 17-year-old alleged accomplice sprung out of bushes, first trying to carjack a 20-year-old woman. I saw in my rear view mirror that someone was running behind my car um, and approached my driver's door. Unsuccessful, the allegedly armed teenagers, one wearing a balaclava, then accused of targeting a 29-year-old man. This young fella opens the door. I'm sat there bamboozled. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, get out the car. And then his mate opens the passenger door and then he hops in the passenger side, has a gun. The young father jumping out as the accused pair clumsily speed off. My car's manual, so they actually stalled it. The worst thing that could happen is her mum telling a story that her dad's not coming home because he tried to be a hero over Mazda 3s. Three search warrants carried out at Bosley Park, Adenza Park and Doonside. Right away also leading to the arrest of a 17-year-old. Among the evidence seized, a replica handgun. We do not believe that is the firearm that was used in the offences. We suspect a, a real firearm was used. Both teenagers have been charged with armed robbery. The 18-year-old refused bail today. His lawyer telling the magistrate this was a defendable case, despite the prosecution noting CCTV, which allegedly shows the accused dumping the stolen car. Police haven't ruled out making further arrests. Hayley Francis, Nine News. A van brought down power lines closing the Hume Highway at Greenacre early this morning. Emergency services were called just after midnight, but the driver had left the scene. Police have spoken to witnesses as part of their investigation. Two cars collided at Concord last night, one of them slamming into a power pole on Patterson Street. Two women in a Toyota sedan were taken to hospital with minor injuries just after 11pm. The 17-year-old driver of the Hyundai SUV wasn't hurt. Our doctors, the Premier and Federal Health Minister all agree the Medicare system is broken and in need of an urgent fix. One GP from Sydney South West has told Nine News about the troubling cases he sees on a daily basis. Dr Kenneth McQuarrie is on the coalface of care in Campbelltown where too often patients are leaving it too late for help. We've got people coming in with leg amputations, with kidney transplants because they've got diabetes, which we could have prevented if they'd spent time visiting their GP. With bulk billing appointments in decline and gap fees rapidly rising, people are either delaying visits to their GP or heading to hospital instead, clogging the system. Of the three million plus cases at New South Wales emergency departments last year, more than a third had symptoms like migraines, earaches and sprains. Another 400,000 patients needed help for rashes, minor aches and pains. Dominic Perrottet finding an unlikely ally in Victorian 
Union leader Daniel Andrews, the Premier's pushing for immediate action on what they say is a broken Medicare system. You've got Labor and Liberal Premiers working together. It's not about politics. It's about getting the best health outcomes for our people. Even the Federal Health Minister is on the same page. It has never been harder to see a doctor and never more expensive. A review into Medicare will be released in the next few weeks with a boost to rebates among the options explored. $750 million has already been set aside for improvements, but those on the front line say that's not nearly enough. We're seeing some practices just not being able to make a go of it, and this is something new. We need to be able to fund our doors to stay open. I need to be able to pay my staff, I need to be able to pay for equipment. Tiffany Genders, Nine News. The funeral of former Pope Benedict XVI in Vatican City will begin in just over an hour. Europe correspondent Kari Ann Greenbank is at St Peter's Square tonight. Kari, mourners are gathering there in huge numbers. Well, Amelia, right now, tens of thousands of people are packing into St Peter's Square. And just walking here, we've witnessed the crowd surging and swelling to get inside. Uh, among those taking part in the funeral, world leaders, priests and nuns, Catholics who have travelled from around the world to be here, and tourists who were just in Rome, keen to witness history as it unfolds. Now, the Vatican says almost 200,000 people attended Pope Emeritus Benedict's lying in state over the past three days, which was much more than anticipated. And it also says that the funeral will be marked by simplicity, as he asked, but it will also follow a similar pattern to a reigning pope, uh, which includes that he's buried in three coffins. Now, the heads of state of Italy and Germany, they're here now, but most countries uh, will be sending representatives, which in most cases will be their ambassador to the Vatican, Emilia, and that includes Australia. A very special day. Kari, thank you. A Ballina man accused of murdering his partner did not apply for bail while facing multiple charges at Lismore Court today. 66-year-old Robert Huber is also alleged to have breached a domestic violence order when he allegedly killed 64-year-old Lindy Lucina. He's due back in court next week. The driver involved in yesterday's fatal pedestrian crash at Canley Vale has now been charged. The 52-year-old woman allegedly hit a 64-year-old woman who was walking with a relative on Sackville Street. She's accused of dangerous and negligent driving and not giving way and was granted bail to face court later this month. Australia has done a deal to significantly boost its firepower, fast-tracking the purchase of long-range rocket launchers and missiles. Defence experts say it's a game-changer, but warn we will need even more military muscle in increasingly dangerous times. Some call it a new god of war. 20 of these rocket launchers will soon be added to Australia's arsenal. This is a game-changer for the Defence Force. Allowing the force to fire much further. We'll go from an Australian army able to strike targets roughly 30 kilometres away to being able to strike targets in excess of 499 kilometres. The federal government says it's fast-tracked the purchase of the US-made high-mobility artillery rocket system amid a surge in demand after Ukraine used the truck-mounted machines to turn the tide in the war against Russia. What we've seen in Ukraine is that they are incredibly accurate and that they can be moved quickly. They're expected to be in Australian hands by 2026. This puts us in a league where a potential adversary has to seriously think twice before contemplating engaging us in a firefight. The government also signing a deal for new missiles for our warships. The decision to increase the speed of the acquisition is a reflection of our strategic uncertainty. And analysts say there is need for speed. The security situation in the Indo-Pacific, in and around Australia, is as precarious as it's been in generations. As an increasingly assertive China beefs up its military might. There is a real sense of urgency here. The whole world is worried about what an aggressive China might do uh, against Taiwan or in the South China Sea. The government says these new defence deals are worth between $1 and $2 billion all up. But it can't reveal the exact figure for national security reasons. Experts say it's an important step, but the Defence Force still needs to muscle up a lot more. We're a long way away from where we need to be. We are now where we should have been five, ten years ago. Fiona Willen, Nine News. 
Moscow claims 89 servicemen were killed in a New Year's strike in part of the Russian-controlled Donetsk region because troops were using their phones when they weren't supposed to. It comes as Russian President Vladimir Putin announced he sent a ship armed with new hypersonic cruise missiles towards the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. Passengers flying out of Xiamen arriving in Sydney this morning were among the first travellers from China required to produce a negative COVID test before boarding. Federal Health Minister Mark Butler says there's been a high degree of compliance since the new requirement came into effect today. It's a precautionary approach to a fast evolving COVID wave in the largest country on the planet with very little information about exactly what is happening on the ground. The Albanese government has also begun wastewater testing on planes landing in Australia from China to better understand any new COVID variants. Well, Sydney siders have been getting reacquainted with blue sky lately, but today the city was painted a dreary grey. Experts are now warning we could experience the opposite extreme next summer with a possible return of bushfires and drought. Try as it might, the sun was fighting a losing battle today. Our summer spell broken by a grey gloom. An overnight storm leaving its mark at Sylvania waters, while at North Sydney Oval, the Big Bash was abandoned. That's disappointing. As the sun rose, brollies were back in hand. But experts say wet days could soon be fewer. It certainly is a shift uh, from the cooler, wetter weather to the warmer, drier weather. The latest modelling by the Bureau of Meteorology suggests La Nina, which has brought record rainfall, will end next month, followed by average conditions over winter and then, concerningly, the chance of another extreme weather cycle next summer. So the chances of an El Nino emerging uh, over the next several months are roughly 50-50. Australia hasn't experienced El Nino since 2016, the weather pattern associated with an increased risk of bushfire and drought. Once those uh, areas do dry out, that does mean we're going to see potentially a lot of fuel ready to burn for bushfires. The Bureau of Meteorology says it won't know for certain whether El Nino will develop or a more neutral weather pattern continue until the second half of the year. Remarkably, the black summer bushfires happened in a neutral phase, proving the impacts of every weather cycle are impossible to predict. There's a big Pacific uh, circulation pattern and that at the moment is in the cool phase. If an El Nino does occur, it may not be as severe as it otherwise would be. Elizabeth Bryan, Nine News. And with a check of today's weather, Here's Sophie. Evening, Sophie. Good evening, Amelia. Summer was nowhere to be seen today in Sydney with showers and temperatures well below average. Most of the rain fell while we were sleeping. The city collecting 13 millimetres. Campbelltown received a drenching, picking up 50 millimetres overnight. Penrith recorded around 20. Wild swell out on the water too. The Manly Ferry, not for those with a weak stomach today, bouncing around in choppy conditions. Yeah, not for me. A gusty southerly change moved up the coast today, making it feel around six degrees cooler than it was. Watamala recorded the strongest gust early this morning, 95 kilometres an hour. Canal 76, Sydney Airport peaked at 74 kilometres an hour, 72 the top at Manly. 69 on the harbour, much calmer at Penrith and 33 kilometres an hour. A cool at night across Sydney, dipping to 17 in the city before a high of 23 that felt more like 17 degrees. The west reaching 21 degrees just after lunch. The cool conditions stretching right down the coast, so when will summer return? I've got those details coming up a little later. Amelia. Thank you, Sophie. See you then. Next on Nine News, a holiday fun quickly turns to fear for these tourists. Their boats swallowed by waves on the south coast, injuring seven. Battle of the cities, the coveted title Sydney's set to lose to a southern rival. The fishermen who put it all on the line to get their snappy catch back out to sea. And why being out of breath could be a sign of a serious underlying health issue.